course. Just go ahead and download it. You can do this whilst I'm speaking, okay? So I'm going to leave this uh, on the screen for a few minutes. And uh, just, I need to give you a disclaimer as well. We are not affiliated with Air in any way. We're an independent company that is training on every airline. Our trainings work for every airline and it's been proven to be successful on every airline. So you'll get a whole bunch of fact sheets about them, about their fleet, about their network. You'll get a cultural fact sheet as well about the culture of this specific airline, the keywords they use, their expectations in terms of CRM. And finally, a selection synoptic sheet that will tell you exactly what to expect during the selection in terms of recruitment phases. As you know, Wizair runs over two days. And so we have put together a document that will list the different phases. Also, as a bonus, there's an extra module where I explain the Wizair strategy. They have a very clear mission. So you need to go into the interview room with that mission in mind. So what are we going to do then today? We're going to talk about the Wizair assessment a little bit, what it's made of. Then we're going to talk about group interview pitfalls. The group interview is the most difficult part, I would say, with the sim of the Wizair assessment because the, it's a uh, eliminatory phase. So I wanted to focus on this today. Then we're going to talk about SIM assessment basics, but we're going to do more than basics today. We're going to reveal for the very first time the five key pitch settings on the Airbus 320. I think this will open your eyes as well to how much work you still need to do. So we'll talk about the one degree, one mile, 100 feet per minute. We'll talk about instrument flying skills and how to get back to the airfield when you're anywhere in space using just one needle and an ILS signal. We're going to talk about teamwork and leadership, and then we're going to talk about the session itself. Then we're going to get into how can we help with the solutions that we have for you if you want to go further. Today's presentation is going to increase your chances quite a bit. If you want to increase your chances a lot, then we will tell you about the full array of solutions that we have for our clients. So let's talk about the Wizair assessment overview. So first of all, you'll have a technical company and math test, like a multiple choice questionnaire and you need to work. Okay. So you just, you need to work and hopefully you will pass that. You should go on pilotassessments.com and work uh, their multiple choice questionnaire and hopefully you will be able to pass. Good. So then you have the group exercise. So those who pass phase one, go to phase two. And the group exercise is eliminatory. And that is very rare because group exercises are usually not eliminatory for the very, very simple reason that no group exercise is the same for every group. So it's, is it really fair that you would be eliminated there? Usually the group exercise is a way to see how you behave with others. And some of what you've done or what you've said will be carried over to the final interview. Well, it's not the case at Wizair. The group exercise is eliminatory. And let me tell you, so there's a very high fail rate at this group exercise and you want to be ready for that. Then we'll talk briefly about the HR and technical interview because it is less important at Wizair than with other airlines. And then we'll talk about the SIM assessment. So the focus today will be on the group exercise the SIM assessment, and we'll talk briefly about the HR and the technical interview. The airline selection process is a chain, so there are multiple links to this chain. And each big link like this has sublinks, okay? So you need to be good or better at each link in order to pass. If you're weak at one, your excellence in another link will not compensate your weakness in one. You need to be good or better everywhere. Right. So here we've um, listed four steps. So there's the preparation. So you need to prepare, obviously. That's what you're doing now. Just watching this webinar, this is what you're doing. Then you will get to the airline on the next three steps and you will attend psychometrics and other tests. Then you'll have your interviews. And then finally, you'll have your SIM. Some airlines run the SIM ahead. It happens. Most of them will run it at the end. Why? Because the SIM costs money. So if they've eliminated some some pilots before, then they won't have to spend money on the sim. Good. So tonight's objectives will be, so we're not going to talk about preparation because I assume that if you're here, you probably already have been invited. So congratulations. We'll talk briefly about English, but that's not the point of today's presentation. 
Psychometrics and other tests, we won't talk about them because you just need to go and work on pilotassessments.com and you will get the results that you that are proportional to how much work you put in. Today, we're going to talk about interviews, the group and the HR interview. And we're going to talk about the SIM assessment. Okay, good. So a few stats. This is a well-known fact that on average, 25% only of candidates succeed. And the reason for this is this lack of gap training is because the airline's demanding something that the pilot does not necessarily understand. And so they, when they receive the pilot, they go, oh my God, they don't know that. Oh, well, it doesn't behave like expected. There's a very sad statistic from the French DGAC that says that 50% of airline pilots who've got an ATPL don't renew their licenses after three years. They don't tell me that only 50% of people who have a license are fit to, to go into a flight deck. So this has to change for sure. So the number one reason for failure is English. Okay. So it might not be the case if you're a, a German pilot applying for a German airline, a French pilot applying for a French airline, but in the context of Wizz Air, for sure, the number one reason for failure is English. Okay. Of course, if you're an English speaking native, it's not a problem for you, but if you're not, it is a problem. How can you know if you're good enough in English? If you've got a level six, you're probably good enough. If you've got a level five, not necessarily. I tend to say, if you translate in your base language, when you speak, you are probably not good enough. You see it very well when you run group interviews with people that those who speak good English are a lot quicker. They don't have 30 or 40% of their capacity impaired by translating or struggling with language. So the number one reason for failure is English. So if you still have time to work on your English and you know that you're translating in your head, do something about it. Your career depends on it. So the second reason for failure is lack of preparation. It's what I was explaining before. People having a misunderstanding of how much work is required to get into airlines. I can tell you, we see a lot of pilots applying and those who we've got a lot of our clients succeed. Everything we tell them to do, they do it to a T and they get results and they are not scared of doing some more work. Okay. And if we do a practice interview together and I tell them, this is not working. You need to readdress it. We need to do another one. They say yes. And they come back and they they fixed it and now they're ready. Okay. There's a lot of work we need to get in. You need to have done a list of your flights. You need to arrive in the interview room, sure of who you are, sure of what the airline is, sure of their strategy and to have a compelling arguments when asked a question. Okay. This, it doesn't take that much talent. It takes work. That's all. So our pass rate is three times more than the industry standard. Wizard is actually one where our pass rate is at 75%. It's one of the lowest that we've got because the Wizard selections are so tough, but still our pass rate with them is 75%, which is very high. With some airlines, we have close to 100%, okay? Because their selections are, you know, don't eliminate people at stages where, like the group interview, for instance, good stuff. Good. So now let's talk about the group exercise, the dreaded group exercise. So we talked about the key competencies. And so here we have nine ICAO key competencies. If you're a cadet, you have no idea what I'm talking about probably, but if you're a low timer, you already know this. So you've seen at the base, there is knowledge, handling, auto flight, application of procedures, workload management, situational awareness, leadership and teamwork, communication, problem solving, decision making. So these are ICAO competencies and you will be graded on your flights. You will be graded in the SIM according to these key competencies. So these competencies are then translated to recruitment competencies. And there are eight, if you want to write them down, you can drive, communication, problem solving, decision making, workload management. You can see that these two are in the pyramid. Teamwork, leadership and influence, flexibility and creativity and intellectual honesty. These are the recruitment competencies that the recruiter is going to want to identify and want to have evidence that you have these competencies because they are required on the flight deck. Okay. So, so some of them here in the pyramid, they can't evaluate because they can only be evaluated in the sim. Good. So, but these, the great thing for the uh, recruiter is that they can be, uh, yeah, is that they can be evaluated using not only the interview, but also a personality questionnaire, which is a scientific way of knowing what someone is made of, what their personality is made of, underlying personality factors that when combined make an observable behavior and they have a very scientific approach. On the base of that, they will be able to ask you very clear questions on areas of 
perceived weakness from a personality point of view. So you see, it's recruitment is a science. It's extremely interesting. And that's why I love it so much. But now this is also what you're being subject to. So at, at Wither, a little bit less, they're going to do it more by intuition or they're going to, because they don't run a personality questionnaire at Wither. But still, if you know these, you're able to project yourself adequately. And it's important at any airline, whether they run a personality questionnaire or not. For each of these, each of these competencies, there, there are wanted behavior on the left, unwanted behaviors on the right. And there's a whole list of, if this person says that, then their communication is not very good. If they're speaking for too long and they get lost in digressions, then their communication is poor. If they see the problem, not the solution, then that problem solving decision making is poor. You see, there's a whole list of things. So I'm not going to detail this today. Otherwise the presentation will last too long. This is the point of the advanced interview course. Our flagship course details this in an eight module course that lasts seven hours. Yes, there's a lot of work to do, but then after that things tend to click and you understand really what's going on and your interview experience gets so much better. So good. So now let's, why did I mention all this is because of course, these key competencies are being evaluated at the group exercise, and this is what's going to happen to you at Wizair. So the objective of the group exercise from a Wizair perspective is going to be to validate your English, to see how you work with others, to get a, an idea of your structure, how you organize your thoughts. It's a stressful exercise under time constraints. So you need to structure your thoughts for sure. Okay. So this is a great opportunity to see that. And then to start to get an idea of potential weaknesses within the key competencies that I've just listed so that they may want to ask you specific questions at the interview. Okay. So let's just be clear. The goal of the group interview is not to solve the problem, but to try. Okay. It, you don't have, and it's true in life or anything. You don't have an obligation of a result. You have an ob obligation of, of trying. Okay. Good. But you're going to try, you're going to try hard. Good. So the wizard scenarios are this, the famous Lego exercise. I'm sure you've heard of it. Well, typically you are, it's four of four or five of you. I think they run it sometimes with five. I think it's four. And there is a Lego, typically it's an aviation Lego, a plane, a tug, a tractor, whatever it is, uh, a towing tractor. And, uh, you basically it's the, all the pieces are, are collapsed. And then one of you will have the map and they will go in the corner of the room where they don't see other people's body language and have to use words in order to try and help put the pieces of the Lego together. Let me tell you, you need to be quite good in English for that. So you could practice this actually. But you know, to stick the round bit and the peg into the bolt and you see it's, it can get quite complicated fairly quickly. And then you turn, you take it in turns. I think it's such a great exercise. I, I love, I love the idea of it. So there's that, but there are other scenarios as well that have been reported. You're crashing in the jungle, your plane's crashing in the jungle and you have limited supplies. Who are you going to bring with you in order to try and survive, knowing that if you leave the others behind, they'll likely die, you know, so you have to choose based on personality, based on the equipment they carry, or you have to choose which objects you're going to take. These are usually fairly simple. If you have a scenario like this, just make priorities. So the idea is to structure it. So, okay, how much time do we have? Okay. We have 20, 25 minutes. Let's spend five minutes just reading the exercise. Do we have the same exercise, everybody? The same scenario. Okay, good. Let's just read it. And then after that, we can decide a strategy. Okay. Are we going to stay close to the plane? Are we going to, are, are we going to try and navigate? And we're going to have to decide how we set priorities in order to come to a conclusion. You know, do we take the people we like, or we take the people who have skills? Do we take the objects that we, uh, that are good for survival or the objects that are good for finding food, for instance, once you've done these priorities, the exercises can be done so fast. If you take the initiative of giving these priorities, you're going to shine. Okay. So I'll, we'll talk about it a bit more in a minute. So you're part of a crew of a sinking boat with limited survival raft space. Some people are going to die typically. Who would you save knowing that you also have to navigate 30 kilometers away to an uninhabited island. Okay. An emergency landing over the ocean with multiple parameters to take into consideration. At what time can the restaurant bus expect to be served tonight, given that you have this and that many customers coming in that time, you have blue tables and red tables and you have people can stay at the bar for X amount of minutes. 
Okay, that's an inter interesting scenario. On this one, this is one one that we run for our clients. Often, the people don't have the same information, so that's why it's important in the beginning to find out: Do we have the same information? Uh, good and um, and uh, to try and and keep the time and keep the structure. I'm going to detail this in a, in just a second. So, just to be clear, at the group interview, your goal is not to shine and be the leader who saves the world. No, this will just attract problems to you unless you're an excellent leader who knows to involve everybody and you're a natural leader with an incredible brain, okay? If you're not like that, some people are like that. If you're not like that, just, just, it's a risky, risky environment. You work with people you don't know. So the best, remember, the idea is to minimize your risk. Now, minimizing your risk doesn't mean not speaking at all. If you don't speak at all, it won't work. But, so I'm going to detail what I mean. So easy wins. Keeping the time. So offering to keep the time and keeping the time and remaining aware of time, situationally aware of time, establishing structure, like we said, so trying to put together a plan and then keeping the structure. Say that you decided that you're going to take with you the people who have skills instead of the people who you like. And 15 minutes into the discussion, one of the candidates goes, yeah, but this guy, he's He's been known for being a, a bit of a racist. People are not going to get along with him. I suggest we don't take him, but he's a survival expert. Then you have to go, guys, I agree with you or whoever the name of the person is, John, I agree with you. The thing is, as a group, we have decided that we are going to take people with survival skills. And so I feel given that we have a limited amount of time that we stick to this strategy so that we can come up with a tangible result within the time. If we have time at the end, Maybe we can reconsider this. You see, what you've done is you've established structure or maybe someone else has done it, but now you're keeping structure. Believe me, a change of strategy halfway will make the time to resolution so much longer. It will be bad for all of you. So, okay. This is why setting priorities is good and keeping structure. Good. So I told you, you're not there to save the world on your own. So the idea oops the idea is that you let's the idea is not to be an overwhelming leader let someone take the lead usually someone who's not been to one of our trainings will have planned to take the lead because someone told them you need to be the overwhelming leader there are candidates that that behave like that i've heard that more at wizard than in other places so be ready for that let them take the lead one thing to know the leader is busy leading. Unless he's incredibly smart also, he's busy leading, he's not solving. He or she is not solving. So let them take the lead. You're going to start to solve and you're going to contribute actively. And the idea is then you offer to keep time. If the leader hasn't, you're going to offer to, in a smart way, to make a plan. If the leader starts to lead in every direction, you're going to, at some point, have to intervene and go like, yeah, but let's make a plan. Let's just make a plan because, and try to explain why you're coming up with specific suggestions. You want to make a plan. Why? Because plans save time. You like an object, explain why you like the object. So let's make a plan because if we make a plan, we will save a lot of time and we'll have capacity to refine it in the end. Okay. You see, explain things. It's part of leadership. Remember leadership and influence, how to influence others. It's also about knowing how to explain your decisions. Okay. Explain your feelings about something. Okay. So support the leader and take leadership temporarily when it's appropriate to do so. And you act like a supporter of the leader and the leader will catch their breath a little bit. So you don't go against the leader unless you have to, but just help them be their assistant. So to say this role is the best you can have because in this assistant role, so to say you're active. You show the skills it's very similar to the ones of a co-pilot on the flight deck where you're going to be like a, um, either a pilot monitoring or uh, just a co-pilot during pre-flight, okay? So this, uh, to me, is the winning, the winning position. If you take the lead at some point, because maybe you had a, a group where you were the one with the more, most natural charisma, you never know this, you can never know this, or everybody's very quiet today except you, well, take the lead and then share the lead. Give it away. Offer for someone to do something. That way you keep capacity so you can continue solving. Because remember, the leader is responsible. 
the leader makes mistakes, who pays for it the most? The leader. Okay. So share leadership freely and, and uh, that way you can save thinking capacity. Good. And then you can participate and help those that are quiet. Some people won't talk much. They are shy. Maybe their English is such a problem that they don't dare say anything, but they've earned their seat at the table, just like you. They're smart. So um, help, help them out. Ask them questions. You'll find that usually they have the answer to the whole riddle. They have the answer to the whole thing, the best answer, because they've been, they weren't busy leading. They were busy thinking. So involve them. Okay. And if you bring someone in, don't just do it, say, oh, I've brought them in. Now it's over. No, bring them in and listen to what they say. That's important. Okay. So, and if the dynamic gets lost, if they get lost in digressions or just redirect, tell them, guys, we only have 10 minutes now. It's time that we uh, come to a conclusion. Okay. Good. Okay. So the HR and tech interview. So on this, we said we were going to talk fairly briefly. The classic interview is, so it's difficult to qualify the wizard interview. It's a hybrid in a way. So there's three types of interviews. There is the advanced interview when they use a personality questionnaire. There's the classic interview where you have no personality questionnaire. And that, that is the hybrid interview with no personality questionnaire, but situational questions where they try and put you on a hypo hypothetical flight. The classic interview is more basic where they ask you broad questions about yourself and they try to just do everything based on gut feeling, not so much skill. Okay. So the classic interview is the, so, and, and I, with there is, in some way, a classic interview, in some way, a hybrid interview, because there's a technical element to it and they do ask for some scenarios. Okay. But some of it, I would say is still classic because it's, it goes quite fast on the HR element. The classic interview is the most tricky. Now there is an HR specialist there as well as a pilot from what we know, which means there is someone who is probably trained on recruitment. Pilot may or may not be trained. I mean, if you are trained in recruitment, normally you're trained on personality questionnaires, but if they don't run one, your training has probably been cut a bit short. So then how short has it been cut? How detailed is it? We don't know. When your training in recruitment is not extensive, what happens is you end up using gut feeling. And when you use gut feeling, you make mistakes. And so that's why the classic interview, which is one where gut feeling comes into play the most, is the one where recruitment mistakes are made. That's why it's the most tricky. So, yeah, so a classic interview is no, person, no personality questionnaire. And so subjectivity and gut feeling comes into play and recruitment errors are common. This is also why I think there's quite a high fall rate altogether at WizAir. So the WizAir interview is, like we said, classic tech, classic tech and it's an unusual hybrid. No personality questionnaire. And so, first of all, because there's going to be questions, you need to be strong on knowledge. You need to have thought of scenarios that they ask. Just go on pilotassessments.com and see what recent questions people have gotten. And you just need to know your stuff. Okay. But you also need to have a lot of operational knowledge. This is something we bring you in both the advanced interview course and the sim preparation course. You need to have, be able to anticipate potential situations that happen on the line in order to shine at this interview. At the classic interview, I often say, the problem is they're going to use gut feeling. If they use gut feeling, there's many ways you can use gut feeling. One could be just because of, they feel that you don't have the competencies. One of them could be that for some reason, they don't really like you. Maybe it's where you come from. Maybe it's your accent, maybe. And they just can't put their finger on it. There's something that, you know, they just don't like. This is something that experienced recruiters try to shy away from because we're supposed to evaluate, can you do the job? Not, can you be my friend? Okay. You still need to be polite on the flight deck and have good CRM. Of course, but I'm not here to evaluate how much of a good friend I would be with you, but more, can I work with you properly? Can you do the job? So if you are in the situation where you end up in an interview room with someone who for some reason doesn't really like you from the get go. The idea is to get them to like you by showing how professional you are, how prepared you are, how keen you are, and to speak pilot to pilot language. And uh, this is why depth of knowledge is so important. Good. So you're going to want to impress them with operational knowledge. And here SPC means sim preparation course, which we'll talk about at the end. Good. So classic interview questions can, are very broad. 
tell us a little bit about yourself. What are your three main qualities and shortcomings? Why do you want to come and work with us? What challenge do you think we are facing at the moment? That's a question you can get at the advanced interview as well. You need to know that. What challenge is this airline facing at the moment? And don't every company, my company, a large airline, they all have problems, challenges. Okay. You, we all, you, there's always something you can do better. There's always a threat from the outside. There's always a, a staffing issue, you know, so you want to have the answer to that question. And if you don't today, it means you're not, you're not prepared enough. What challenge do you foresee in working with us? That's a tricky question. What should a good pilot be? Very tricky question. People give vague answers to this, meaning they've not thought about their job enough. Why should we choose you? Well, guess what? That's the, um, the answer to this is exactly the same as what should a good pilot be? Because you're a good pilot, right? So you're going to give the exact same answer. We give the answer to that in the advanced interview course in quite a lot of detail. Good. And what will you bring to our airline? Again, that's the same answer as the two preceding ones. Good. So I told you this was going to be brief, but that's so that we leave lots of space now to discuss the sim exercise. Good. So this is the first time that we're going to share so much about the sim exercise. We've never shared this in a webinar before, not in this amount of detail. So I'm very happy about it and prepared. I prepared quite a lot for this today to give you something really nice, I hope. Good. So sim assessment basics. First of all, the selection sim is different from any other sim exercise that you will face in your whole career. Why? Because it is not an MCC type exercise. It is not a typewriting type exercise. It is not an OPC or an LPC. It's completely different. Typically at MCC, everything's pretty much working. You're going to get failures as you go, but you take off with the flight director. You take, you, you can engage the autopilot at, for most sessions. You've got the auto throttle working. And then yes, you get some failures and degradations. The sessions are long. Typewriting, pretty much the same. You just go more deeper into the machine. Now at the, uh, at the uh, selection sim, it's very short and you have no automatics or hardly any, and you have no map during the whole MCC, you have a map. Now you have no map. You have just a VOR needle or two. That's all you've got. You're taking off with no flight directors, just the pitch, the, the pitch square that's moving up in the empty and no FMA. I mean, if you've done your MCC, you know what I'm talking about. Imagine if you've not thought of that before. You're up for a big surprise on the day of the sim. So you need to work on your handling, spatial orientation for sure. And it's important to, that you refresh yourself on MCC. There, the MCC work, if you take that into the sim assessment, everything will work fine. Uh, you need to understand that they are assessing behaviors in the sim as well. I think at Wizair, they're doing a lot of the CRM assessment in the group exercise, and then they think, okay, We'll catch whatever we still need to see during the sim. Good. So I'd like to speak about Michelle. Michelle has designed half, a good half, uh, and probably the most significant and innovative half of the sim preparation course. He's got 24,000 flying hours. He's a former Air France A330 TRE, and he worked for several other airlines. Just out of curiosity, he left Air France ahead of his time just to go and work for low-cost airlines. Interesting. And now he dedicates his time to helping others. And he trained a fantastic team of sim preparation experts, both on the Boeing 737 and A320. He delivers this in Charles de Gaulle. And uh, we got along immediately because we have the same purpose. I've designed the e-learning bit. It's me who's talking, but it's his technique that I'm going to show you today. So the reason why we've done this in an e-learning format is that we found that Michel's teaching was great, but he was getting candidates that would come to the sim without knowing much. The remembrance of the MCC was quite far away and there was very little they could learn about the machine, in fact, how to fly raw data. So we put this in an e-learning so that candidates arrive in the sim preparing with Michel, not requiring a two-hour briefing, which is very tiring for him and also very tiring for the candidate who ends up coming in the sim after two hours of this and a toilet break, exhausted already. Imagine if you have to then do two hours, one hour PM, one hour PF, I mean, like your toast. So by doing this in preparation course, you can study this at length and you arrive and just a one hour briefing and off you go. And it's a much, much better way to also be able to prepare on both machines, depending if you've got a selection or not. So it's just a big tribute to Michelle. 
our friend here at, uh, at ASP. Okay, good. So now let's get into his technique. And you know, once you've done the sim preparation course, you can go in any sim, even if it's not with Michelle, with myself, or uh, with our other instructors, you, you can go anywhere and use these techniques. It will just save you so much time. Good. So the five key pitch settings, they are essential. And Michelle constantly tells us this is what people feedback after their assessment that helped them the most. That's why we're going to talk to you about them today. They work whatever the weight. The thrust will vary very little. Only one of the pitch settings has a high thrust. The, um, anyway, you were always pretty much going to take off at 60 tons during an assessment, 55, 60 tons, being on a 737 or an A320. You're going to take off fairly heavy, but not above max landing weight. Why? Because the plane handles better when it's heavier. And so, and so the speeds are going to be pretty, pretty standard, I would say. But anyway. Even if you had a very light plane, you would use the same pitch, just a resulting speed for an Airbus, the resulting green dot, instead of being 220 knots, would be maybe 205 knots, but the pitch would be the same. Good. So now let's talk about the five key pitch settings on an Airbus 320. The 320 is a bit more tricky than the 7.3 because there's the flight control laws, as you know, and they kind of modify the pitches a bit. So then you, there's an ideal 320 and then there are adaptations that you have to take for each sim where you go. Now, if you fly in a CAD-D full flight sim that costs, you know, 50 million euros, that one will always be the same. But if you go to a sim center that has an FNPT2 or even a very nice sim that's not CAD-D, well, then there'll be small variations in pitch. It doesn't happen on the 737. So we're going we're gonna to help you the best we can with the most classical setup for the 320. and. Anyway, the goal here is that you understand the concept more than anything. In the sim preparation course, we give you more detail, more sheets, summaries and stuff. But uh, here you're going to get quite a lot tonight already. Okay. So the first pitch is flap zero, 250, not level. Okay. That's the first pitch setting. When you arrive on the approach at around 6,000 feet, you are at that. Then the second pitch is flap zero, green dot speed. So I should have written flap up actually, because that's the way they say it on the Airbus. But anyway, flap zero, green dot speed, level. In fact, the first four pitches are level, only the last one is on the ILS. Pitch three is flaps one, S speed, level. Yeah, flap one is S speed. That's the speed that goes with flaps one. On the Boeing, you would say flap one speed. But on the Boeing, the equivalent of, of flaps one is actually flaps five. Anyway, pitch number four. Now you are... Gear down, flaps three, F speed level. Now you're just about to intercept the ILS. Okay. You notice that there is no flap two. For the purpose of this technique, we are going to use flap two as a decelerating, decelerating transitionary flap setting. Pitch five, now you're gear down, flaps full V app on the glide. Right. So yeah, you're looking at this and you're going like, well, okay, well, how do I use this? Okay. Well, let's, let's get on to pretend PFD. So the first one, is between two and a half and five degrees. Okay, so it's between the two lines. Yeah, I'm sure you can see my mouse here. It's between two and a half and five. You put the box in between the two lines. The second one, you put the box roughly on the line. So in fact, every, uh, on every different pitch setting, you increase by 1.25%, okay? Because each of these lines are distant by two and a half percent. Okay, so let me just move my camera, yeah. Good. Then the third one, you're now between the next two lines. And the fourth one, you're on the seven and a half degree line. Okay. This one is super important. It's the only one that's got a high pitch setting, a uh, high, sorry, thrust setting. And you can easily understand why you are now level with the gear and flap three. Of course, you need a lot of thrust. Okay. But the idea is to be there for not too long. Good. And then the last one, so the idea is that when you are two dots below the glide, you're going to go from the third to the fourth pitch setting. So now we're at flaps one. Now you're going to go flaps two, gear down, flaps three, and you're going to go to F speed. Okay, you're going to do all that. And hopefully all this energy will wash off between two, two dots between the, below the glide to rough, roughly just before the, 
your diamond is touching the, uh, the mid bar. Okay. So hopefully you don't have to put this 75% for very long, but you're going to be on the safe side. So you may have to, when your diamond touches the mid bar here, you push, and now you're going to have to push all the way back to the initial pitch setting here. So the, and it's even lower because remember the first one was between these two. So now you're going to push back. So this is where it depends a lot on the sim. Sometimes, sometimes some sims have it even at like four degrees, which is way too high. But anyway, the, if we summarize, and I'm going to move on here a bit, if we summarize at 250 knots, the first one, you were here, then you were here, then you were here, then you were here. And now you, so you pitched up the whole time. And understand what you're trying to do here is you're trying to get level and go from one config to the next level. Okay. Of course, in real life, you're not going to do like that because in real life, you want to do a CDA. You want to con do constant descent approach. You want to do economical flying. Okay. But in this case, no, first of all, there's no real fuel and no passengers Two, you've got a degraded plane that you're flying raw data. You want to put all the chances on your side and you want, don't want to mess up your approach. So you're going to use this and you're going to slow down when you're level. They clear you from 6,000 to 4,000, go down to 4,000, and then you adopt the pitch setting that goes with the config that you're at. And then when you go from one to the next, you adopt the pitch setting first, the, thr the thrust next, and then you trim the plane. And it's quite easy. Or sorry, the pitch, you trim, and then you adopt the thrust. Okay, good. So one, two, three, four, and then back down quite a lot. It's a very big pitch down. Look at that. It's like five, six and a half degrees pitch. And this is why you want to do it when your diamond touches the mid bar, because by the time you're done, you'll be on the glide. Okay. That's a top tip. Good. Now, one more thing. This is the go around. Okay. So remember we went up, we went down and now surprise, you have to go around. So I will explain this in a minute. You go around. Now you have to go to 15 degrees. Now, when you take off, you're heavy. When you go around, you're not. You've lost some fuel in, in between. When you take off, your takeoff usually derated with not the full thrust. When you go around on a plane like the 320, it's full thrust, not on a 777, because the thrust variation, I mean, it would just be too much. The plane would be unmanageable. But on the 320, it's like that. So basically, when you go around, plane just shoots up quite a bit. You're light and full thrust. So it's likely you're going to go not to just 15, but more like 17 and a half and even maybe a bit more, whichever the case. You will go around initially is 15, uh, 15 degrees or more. You want to maintain, you want to keep that speed in check. V2 plus 10 to V2 plus 25, okay? Sorry, VRF, VRF plus 10 to VRF plus 25. And you're going to climb. And then, you know, things are going to quite quickly. You're going to have quite a high rate of climb, 3,000 feet per minute maybe. And say the go around altitude is at 3000 feet and the elevation was 500 feet. So you only have two and a half thousand feet to go, just maybe a thousand feet to catch your breath. And it's already time to start to lower the nose. So the biggest mistake is people don't forget to lower the nose. Typically they lower the nose too much. So what we suggest is you lower the nose to the fourth pitch setting. This is why it was key. You remember the one where you had 75% of thrust? The one where you had the gear and you had lots of drag, well, you still have lots of drag here. The gear is up, but you still have quite a lot of drag. Okay. So no, normally it's go around flaps three. You, you still have flaps three. So, so you say go around flaps. Okay. But you still have flaps three. You went from full to three. So you're going to lower the nose. You, some people say just half your pitch. So if your pitch was 17 and a half or 18, you can lower it to nine. But if you lower it to seven, to, uh, seven and a half, it will work as well. And then after that, you know, because if, if you pitch down too much, you're still going to climb. The thing is you're going to accelerate and the, uh, you're going to get into the VFE next and you're going to uh, get a, a flap speed exceedance. Very common on the 7.3, um, because the go around is more involving than a 320, but it can happen on the 320 as well. I think the VFE next is around 190, don't quote me on it, 195 or something like that. So you could uh, 185 here. So you 195. So you could be accelerating through that and that's not elegant and that would be a fail in the sim. So seven and a half first, you reduce the thrust accordingly and you make sure that you're still climbing nicely, maybe, you know, 2000 feet a minute and that your speed is not moving too much. And then you can keep that thrust and then you're going to level off when you're at, you know, 10% of the rate of climb that you have after being at seven and a half degrees. And then you're going to nicely then accelerate 
in a way that allows you to retract your flap in a controlled manner. And then you go for the after takeoff checklist, which there is no longer on the Airbus, but maybe they, you know, it's, it's okay if you ask for it because you would on other airplanes. Okay. So I hope this was useful. Let's move on a little bit more. So just to show this to you in even more detail, right? So you started at 250 knot, then you went to green dot speed. Okay. Which is 220 to 205 knots. And so you increase the pitch, increase the pitch, you go to flap one S speed. Then you go to so gear down flap three in the middle here, you use flap two. And so you would start to do that at two dots. Okay. And then when you're just before the intercept, then we, I put final flap here. You would probably do it here. You would first make sure you intercept the glide and then you take final flap because the drag is then going to be enough to reduce the speed. Good. So five pitches. If you want to look at it from this perspective, at 250 knots, you would be at 6,000 feet, 22 miles, something like that. This is something we teach in the sim preparation course. You have to know your altitudes versus expected distance. This is something that they don't teach at flight school and they probably can't. Um, so 250, it's simple. And 6,000, six, six times three is 18 and you've got a bit of excess speed that's 22. Okay. Assuming that there's no wind or a very small headwind. So then green dot, you'd be at 5,000 feet, 17 to 18 miles. Flap one, S speed, 4,000 feet, 12 to 14 miles. You can see the ratio of three here, five times three is 15 and you add a bit for the speed. Here you add a bit because you are quite fast at 250 knots. Here you add a bit because the plane is very thin around green dot. And here you no longer add. So four times three, 12 to 14, just to be safe. And then here you are at 2000 feet here. So two times three, is six. So this is where your ILS will start. Okay. Good. I know this may be going a bit fast for you, but another way to see it. So the, the, the one before was a straight in approach. This one is a. If you arrive from a beam, so you would be at 6,000 feet, 250 knots, just a beam the, uh, the airfield. And look at this. You've got five miles for your base, five miles here as well for your base and 10 miles here, five. So you, so you, you, here you do 10, five, and another 10, that's roughly 25. So see 20, 25, uh, you're looking quite good here. So you could be at 6,000 feet, 250 knots, a beam the threshold. Okay. Because there's a few miles here and the runway is three miles long. Okay. Um, and so you, you could look at it this way and then you would be intercepting here when you're at flaps one, and then you would take flaps two as soon as you were intercepted and slow down. Good. Good. So this was the five key pitch settings. I hope that you enjoyed this. I certainly enjoy teaching it because it's so simple. And after that, you won't see that in the sim, but the good thing is you can practice this on the sim, uh, uh, even on the flight simulator at home. Uh, once you understand this, it, it just becomes second nature. Good. Now the one mile, one mile per minute, 100 feet per minute. So this is something you have to know. I mean, you cannot go to the sim without knowing that. This is something to use when you're asked to complete a 30 to 45 degree turn and climb at the same time, or just when you're being asked to climb or descend, or when you need to do an adjustment to your vertical speed. This is basically this is telling you, okay, if I'm asking you, you're going at 250 knots true airspeed. And I'm asking you, okay, climb at 3000 feet per minute. You should be able to tell me in two seconds, how much pitch variation you're going to apply. If you can't do that, you're not ready. Okay. So let's decompose this together. So there's a triangle, one degree of pitch, one degrees of pitch. So if you're going at, at 180 knots, we're going to assume 180 knots for this one. One degrees, 180 knots, we, we agree is three miles per minute. Okay. So one degrees is three miles per minute is 300 feet per minute. Okay. So that's the rule. One degree, three miles per minute, 300 feet per minute. So if you had, if you did one mile per minute on a very slow plane, it would be 100 feet per minute. And this works for every plane everywhere all the time. Okay. So this is true airspeed. So the indicated airspeed, similar to the true airspeed, if you're not too high, so at, at two or 3000 feet, it works. If you start to get closer to 10,000 feet, you really need to look at the task because it could be 20% difference. Good. Uh, Okay. So now let's take my example. So you want to climb at 1000 feet per minute. If you have 240 knots TAS pitch up by, well, four degrees is wrong. Okay. This slide's got a, it's got a mistake, but let, let's just do it together. Let's climb at 1000 feet per minute on 240 knots TAS. 240 knots TAS, it's 
Yeah, this slide's definitely got a mistake. Sorry about that. It's four miles per minute. So one degree, one degrees will do 400 feet per minute. So it's two and a half degrees. It's as simple as that. And if you had to climb 3,000 feet per minute, it would be seven and a half degrees. Simple. Okay. Now, if you're flying 240 knots indicated and you are at 8,000 feet, maybe you're doing 300 knots task. And then that's five miles per minute. It means that to climb at 1,000 feet per minute, you just need two degrees. Okay. So forgive, uh, forgive me for this slide is wrong, but I think you've understood the idea. Let's go back to this one, which has got correct numbers for the uh, three knots nautical mile per minute case, you need to know the three, the four, and the five. That's all you need. Okay. And then you need to practice mentally. Get a friend to ask you, okay, ask me to climb at three and a half thousand feet a minute. Ask me to climb at two and a half thousand feet a minute. And you need to be able to do that. So then what you could even do if you're good at that, the great thing is you could go in the sim. Okay. You've asked me to climb at 3000 feet per minute. We're going at uh, five, five miles per minute. Therefore I will apply a six degree pitch variation. I mean, if you do that, the instructor is going to go, wow. So, okay. Uh, and, and your colleague is going to now trust you extra, you know? So um, good. It's also useful when you're adjusting your VS on the glide. So when you're on the glide, you're going to be now at 140 knots indicated and TAS. And so now it's two and a half, one, one degree is 215 feet per minute. So on the glide, you know, you're going at an average of seven, 600 or 700 feet per minute. If you pitch up by two degrees, you're going to take 500 feet per minute. That's a lot, you know, like three degrees, you're level now. So we see often people on raw data, they're on the glide or they're not far from it. And then they, with the biggest mistake is they look outside and they pull on the stick at the same time. You do that, you're dead. Because you do that, you, when you pull on the stick when looking outside, you, you, lost, you lose the idea of how much pitch you've pulled. And so, you know, just keep your, keep, keep, stay very aware of that and just pitch just a little. One degree should give you 200 feet per minute. Uh, and usually that should be enough to get you on the glide. Okay. Just one degree at a time when you're on the glide. So it's very useful this. Okay. Good. So instrument flying skills now. Yeah. Cause this was an instrument. This was just handling. So instrument flying skills. Whoops. Okay. So it's about spatial orientation, knowing where you are and how to get somewhere else. This is expected to be good from a recently qualified student pilot. So light issue here. That's fine. Okay. This is expected to be good from a recently qualified student pilot. So you really want to rehearse your instrument flying, but let me teach you some very easy techniques. Okay. So you should know how to um, improve, you should know how to perform a controlled initial climb raw data. So you should be able to climb and this not to be a mess. Okay. Just to climb. So you're just going to set like what I said, 15 to 17 and a half degrees and just climb nicely and be at V2 plus 10, V2 plus 25 in between the two. And you should be able to intercept your initial altitude without too much difficulty. Intercept. If you're going at 3000 feet a minute, you start to lower the nose to your target. If you can use one of the five key pitch settings that, there, it's great. And you're going to just go to your target, 10% of your rate of climb. So if you are climbing at 3000 feet a minute, you're just going to anticipate 300 feet before the target. Okay. So you're going to perform a controlled climb raw data, perform climbs, turns and descents whilst keeping situational awareness. This means you're turning, they ask you to turn one turn in one direction, one turn of the, in, in the other climb and descent. You should try and rem and have an idea of where you are. How to do that? Well, the idea is that you should know the, this airport quite well and the different radio aids that you're probably going to have on, on the map. And you should be looking at the tail of them all the time to go like, oh yeah, this VOR is there. If I draw, I'm on the 240. Okay. I'm here. I'm around here. Okay. They, they put me now. I'm at the east of the airfield now. Okay. At British Airways SIM, when I did my SIM, they, after doing lots of evolutions and having to manage a fog situation or whatever, they stopped the SIM. They said, okay, uh, tell me where you are. And I had like two seconds and I told them, okay, well, we're here. I, uh, yeah, I did a really good SIM that day, but so this could happen to you. Huh? So practice your needles and your awareness. You should be able then to navigate to and hold on a beacon or at an intersection. So that's not difficult to navigate and hold. As a student pilot, you should be able to do that quite easily. Then you should be able to intercept a radial and an ILS axis in an elegant manner. So there's 
not so elegant manner, which is to do a 30 degree intercept. And there's a very elegant manner, which is to do a tangential intercept. This is something that we teach in the SPC. I don't have time to go through it now, but the 30 degree will work. If you do a 30 degree, you need to take a bit more space. And you should be able to do all of that. Autopilot, flight director, and auto throttler. Some airlines, you keep the auto throttle, some not. It brings an extra layer of difficulty. Okay. So for the Wizz Air exercise, you're going to have a limited briefing, the standard climb, raw data, no map. Okay. I don't know whether you keep the auto throttle. I think you don't actually, but I may be wrong. Anyway, you practice without it. It's just the best way. You, then you're going to do climbs, descents, and turns. And then they're going to ask you where you are, similar to my British Airways exercise. And then they're going to tell you, okay, well, uh, yep, that's, this is where you are. There are no more radar control, no more help from us. How do you get back on the field? And we need you to get back on the field, essentially. So there you need to have a technique and I'm going to show you how. Okay. Getting back onto the airfield, the idea is to do an arc DME. Again, this is one of Michelle's techniques and it's so simple. You're going to do a 15 mile. DME arc, which is very easy to do. You're just going to keep the needle. You, there's always a needle on an airfield. Some airfields these days don't. I think Dubai doesn't anymore, but these airfields will have one beacon. You need to know where it is. You need to know on which runway it is. It's so important because it's not necessarily on, on every runway, but one runway will have a radio beacon. And you're going to do a 15 mile arc around that beacon. It's not, sometimes it's not because what if the beacon is slightly offset? then you're going to have to calculate. But if the beacon is on the airfield, bang in the middle of the two runways or just, yeah, very close to the runways, you want to do a 15 mile arc. You keep the needles 90 degrees until you arrive somewhere to the intercept. You intercept at 20 divided by T. T is the time that it takes for you to get. So it's 15 miles. Uh, 20 divided by T is, uh, so 15 miles. So the time you're going at, uh, at this point, you're 180 knots, so three miles per minute. So that's five. Yeah. 20 divided by five. That's four, four, four degree intercept. So four degrees before you arrive. So because you're quite far, if you're closer, it will be more like six. If you're, if you're doing a 10 mile intercept, it's like six degree anticipation. If you're doing a 15 mile intercept, it's a four degree anticipation. But anyway, you can intercept before. And then, so then you start to leave your 90 degree logic, and then you will gradually close the angle until your ILS, and then you'll have the, you'll switch from the VOR needle to the ILS needle. The 320 can have both displayed at the same time, and then it'll be nicely aligned. Very elegant technique. Okay. So let's go to Budapest. So the wizard scenario is not run at Budapest. It's sometimes, I think it is. I think they do it at Luton, Stansted, uh, low cost Irish airline does it at East Midlands often, which is a, tr a tricky little airport, these East Midlands, because the final is very short. But this one is interesting. We've run a scenario like this for some candidates lately. So you see that the VOR is not on, on the airport and you cannot really see it like that. So you need to know that why I put this three VORs because there's no VORs on the other side. So you would know what these three VORs are and you would know which ones are tuned. You could tune two at a time. You want to know that. And as you're doing your turns, if you know, you, you've got a bit of time to yourself, you kind of draw in your mind. Okay. It's telling me zero nine. Uh, 270 from this one. Okay. I'm here. And he's telling me that I'm, you know, 330 from this one. Okay. I'm here. I'm in line with the, with the, with the runway, or maybe you end up here. You, you want to know where you are all the time. Okay. And then after that, you're going to do, and in this case, because there's three miles between the, the runway. So imagine if you take off, you, you need to study the airport. You, they get you to take off on three, one left, which is actually in Budapest, what you do. And then he asked you to come back. What a mess it will be if you try and come back on three, one left. Okay. You're going to go, no, the beacon is on three, one, right. I'm going to come back on three, one, right. I mean, that's like common sense, but doing this, I mean, you win so much, so, so much, so many points in the same. Okay. Um, so you want to know where the radio is are. And then after that, say that you're here, you're going to see, okay, I've, I'm 12 miles away. This is too little. Why? Because here, what you want to remember is you want to be 15 miles from the threshold, 15 miles from the threshold. There's three miles. Yes. You're going to want to do an 18 mile arc. You do an 18 mile arc to end up here, 15 miles. So you can do your slow down and then uh, do everything in a controlled manner. Okay. Good. Budapest. So you have to remember what the elevation is. Okay. Elevation is around 500 feet, 415. So 500 feet, you have to remember this means two and a half here, 
is actually 2,000, right? 2,000 above the ground, which is why we're looking at six miles. Good. And here it doesn't tell you how far the view R is. So this is why you need to pull another chart. And on this one, it tells us somewhere. It tells us I saw it yesterday. Here. Uh, the threshold is 2.5. Okay, you can measure it, but basically, so that's why you're going to do an 18 mile arc. Apart from that, it's pretty, pretty straightforward, really. I would typically, either you intercept the ILS straight from 3000, or you can intercept it from two and a half. I would try and intercept it from 3000. I tried to intercept it a bit higher because then I have time in case I kind of messed up my interception and I have more space, more time to, to fix it. Okay. Good stuff. Okay. Teamwork and leadership now. And we're coming to the end of our sort of presentation on skills. So leadership, remember one thing is that leadership is not the prerogative of the PF. The PM has a very important leadership uh, part to play and monitoring is an active role that is graded. So when you're flying, you have to take the lead, but take into account what the PM says. And when you're the PM, if the PF makes mistakes, you have to highlight them in the softest way that you can. But if they are making mistake after mistake, come a point, you need to be more directive. And if it's too much, don't worry, the instructor will tell you to be a bit more quiet. Okay. So the PM should monitor, assist, and prompt as required. Yes. And if safety is in question, if there's, you know, say that they, the PF is deciding to continue when clearly they're not stabilized, then you're going to have to tell them, you're going to have to intervene. And we teach that in the courses as well. It's something we call the intervention model. And you need to also know your stabilization criteria because you need to know when you're no longer stable. If the other pilot doesn't understand that, you need to understand it for him or her and you need to make the right decision for him or her. Okay, good. So the session, sorry, I've got, it's clicking in the wrong direction. So this now let's go through the session itself. All the briefings are done in the classroom, typically. So they will not waste sim time for that. So they will allow you to, what I know is that with air, very limited briefing time. Okay. They don't allow you to brief in the sim. So if you have any time you have to brief is, is good because it will help you on your CRM. It will help you establish, make the other pilot comfortable, make yourself comfortable. So you'll be airplanes lined up and engines running and a minimum setup will be done by the PF. So the radio aids or, and the MCP, if you're type rated, or even if you're not type rated, showing that you know where these are is a good thing. So the MCP is called an FCU on an Airbus. And then you'll do a minimal rebrief if they allow you. If not, you say, well, I would have done it in real life, but I understand this is a sim exercise, so let's not do it. And then you take off. In the briefing, you can do a briefing like this. So you start with the threats and what you can do about the threats. And then you do can do a want, weather, airport, no times, terrain. Then you go through the chart and you brief only the mandatory items, the number of the date, the number of the date, the seed name, the runway, and the seed altitude. That's it. Then you can do an emergency briefing. Where there's something we detail in the SPC before V1, after V1. You don't want it to be too long. You go through the path page quickly, ask if there's any remaining questions, and then you ask for the before takeoff checklist. And after that, you'll only have four, three to four very simple checklists to do. We said. On the Airbus, there is no after takeoff checklist, and then you have a descent checklist, approach checklist, landing checklist. That's it. And the instructor will have a very simplified version of these so that you can, you don't waste your time on, on the setup too much. Okay. You're likely to have a non-technical event. So it could happen. It could not happen. If you're type rated, you could have a technical event or a non-technical event or both, depending on the time they decide to give you. So a non-technical event would be a sick passenger, a toilet fire at the back, a bomb on board. It's something that would involve, it's important. If you have something happening in your PF, you're going to have to hand over the controls. Okay. You, 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 the mistakes are made when people keep the controls and they try to speak to the person who's giving them the information. This is a fail. This just won't work. So make sure you hand over the controls. We explain this in detail as well in the advanced interview course. And in the sim preparation course, I don't have time to go through the whole thing now, but uh, I think you, if you've been well trained at MCC and then you have to keep your situational awareness, okay. By handing over the control, you keep your situational awareness as high as it can be. Good. So just move this thing here. Good stuff. Very well. Okay. Machine knowledge. Do you need to know the machine or not? Um, to some extent you do, even if you're not type rated. So. You want to know, have basic knowledge of the aircraft and the cockpit. You need to know the MCP, the PFD, the ND, and the ECAM. 
roughly how they work. You're going to want to know essential limitations of the airplane. This is something that we include in the SIM preparation course for both machines. And uh, detailed knowledge, however, is not required. If you, unless you're typewriter, then they will expect a lot more from you. Okay, so that's the end of our presentation. Now we're going to detail what we can do for you if you want to go further. So all our courses, as you've understood, we're specializing in e-learning, bringing this in a format that is easy for you to digest, that you can take at your own rhythm. You can study on, on the computer, you can study on your iPhone, you can study on your iPad, okay? So all of our courses are, have one-year access and they're 100% in English and they're multi-platform. At the preparation stage, we have a CV and cover letter course and then an English proficiency course. So the CV and cover letter course, you've understood, it's a way for you to understand how you can write a compelling CV and a cover letter. And then as an option, if you feel that you don't have the literary skills to do this, then we can do it for you at an extra cost. It's a very cost-effective course, the CV and cover letter course. There's templates, so you can use the templates. You're going to have to modify them to fit your personality, but it's a very cost-effective course. The English proficiency course is a course to help you. We recorded some FCL 055 lessons. Um, there's 13 of them at the time of the recording, and it will expose you to more aviation English so you can jump a level. Now, a disclaimer here as well, at the time when I'm speaking to you in July 2023, we have recorded the first 10 lessons with a base language, French, but we are speaking very little, maybe 5% of the time only spoken in French. And then we work in partnership with an English teacher, Claire is her name, and she is awesome. And she is going to continue recording lessons. We're going to have around 30 lessons at the end. I've started recording lessons myself in pure English. So then at the interview stage and at the sim preparation stage, we're going to talk about that now. So at the interview stage, we have our flagship course, the advanced interview course. It takes a bit of time to go through it, but essentially we talk about the key competency framework. You've seen the pyramid where we explain this in detail and also the other eight competencies. What do they really mean? What do they mean to the recruiter? And then we're going to show you how the recruitment recruiter builds a matrix, how recruitment management require that the recruiter builds a matrix for them to make that decision. I'm going to tell you how to collect company information in, so that you know how to make sheets as nice as ours how to prepare and the mindset to adopt for your big day. We're going to tell you about psychometric tests and how to prepare for them best. And then module four, we're going to tell you about the SIM assessment in more detail than today, decision models, intervention models, and workload management models. This on the advanced interview course is uh, the HR part of the SIM assessment. So we don't teach you flying models, handling, spatial orientation. There. On module five, we talk about the group exercise, very similar to what we've done today. Then on module six, we talk about HR profiling, personality questionnaires, what to expect, how to prepare them, what to take from them. And part of the advanced interview course, you get a professional 16 PF personality questionnaire that is debriefed with one of us, either myself or another specialist that we have trained and worked for ASP. Module seven, we talk about the advanced interview. We teach you how to make an experience sheet. We go through the classic interview and the hybrid interview in much more detail with a whole list of all the questions that you can get. And then in module eight, we have some simulated questions, some questions that have happened in real life at interviews. And we give you ideas of how you would respond to them using everything that you now know. And it's usually at that point that people go, yeah, oh yeah, I understand what's expected now. And people report after taking the advanced interview course that they came to the interviews relaxed and in control. This to me is the best compliment that we can get. And then when they call us, they call their mom when they've succeeded, then they call us and then we're so happy to. Good. So eight modules, it's the only e-learning course in the world focused on airline selections and includes the questionnaire, like we said, with an incredible success rate. Good. So this advanced into your course costs 790 euros. You can flash the code to go straight to the page. Good stuff. And like I said, you can get it as well on, on an iOS app and we're constantly recording modules to improve it further, improve the experience mostly because the content is very good already as it is. Good. So now the SIM preparation course. Now it's got the uh, five key pitches on the 320 and the 737, the pitch speed VS triangle, like we've described. And it's got also some, uh, lots of sheets, some su summary sheets on each machine, summary sheets on the pitch settings and the thrust settings for each machine detailed so that you can really work with sheets that you can actually use. Okay. Then it talks about energy management, quantifying your energy, knowing when you're high, knowing what you do if you're high. This is absolutely essential. You cannot go to an assessment without knowing where you are in 
in space and in energy. Okay. We're going to, we talk about the discontinued approach and the safety window concept. And what's the difference between a go around and a discontinued approach. If you can, you want to do a discontinued approach. If you're too far low, you need to go around. You really want to know both concepts and how to manage them. Then we're going to talk about the stabilization criteria and what to do if you become unstable. It just, uh, well, if you really are unstable, it depends. Is there a greater threat? Typically you're running out of fuel or, or, uh, or can you afford a go around? Okay. Then we teach you how to fly raw data in a controlled manner. We teach you simple autopilot management, spatial orientation, like we just uh, said, CRM basics, the rejected takeoff, how to brief that emergency briefings. And then there are exercises for experience of type rated pilots. And then uh, module 12, we teach you how to fly a traffic pattern in a medium jet, which is something we did at Emirates that uh, I think it's a very nice exercise to ask someone to do, even if they are not type rated, so long you help them enough. Okay. So this, as you can see, it's a big course as well. And uh, sim preparation course is cheaper. So far, it's 12 module course, six hours of content, and it goes through handling orientation procedures, behaviors, and it's the only e-learning course for the sim in the world that we know that is focused on airline selections. Good. So sim preparation course is cheaper. Why is because usually, first of all, we sell it as a package and also there is no, uh, there is no one-to-one -one with it. There's no sim sessions included. Whereas in the advanced in interview course, we have the 16 PF debrief, which is 45 minutes, one-to-one, -one, of course, that has a cost. Buying the questionnaire has a cost, but in this one is e-learning only, so we can do it for $2.99. It's a really good deal for everything that you've got. Now, there, uh, now let's talk about packages. So the gold package has the advanced interview course, the sim preparations, preparation course, and the CV and cover letter course, which I remind you is very important as well. So all of these independently would cost 1169 and you get all that for 999. So for this, you get 21 video modules, 14 hours of content, interview sim and operational skills, all you need. If you are wondering what to take, your English is good enough. This is what you need. You also have anybody who takes the advanced interview course also has the option of a one-to-one -one interview with me, which is priced at 200 euros, where we spend some time together. 45 minutes of an interview, and then we speak for as long as we need for you to make sure that you've understood everything, ask all your questions and to set you off for your interview prepared. I'm like a super expert and well, uh, that's uh, the option of a one-to-one -one with me it has to be scheduled and it is possible for advanced interview course and package clients. So, and then there's the platinum package, which adds the English proficiency course. This is all of our courses. If you think you're a bit iffy in English, even if you're not French, just go for it. You can download our app where you can take our free course if you haven't yet. Uh, and uh, you just type airline selections in, uh, in the app store and you will find it. If you have any questions at the bottom of the website, there's also a little intercom window. You can type messages. We get them immediately. And we're so excited when we get one. So just don't hesitate. I would like to ask you a few questions. However, relevant in regards to my current situation, if I may take five minutes of your time. Yes. So when it comes to that, you can get a 15 minute chat with me at any time. You can get it once. Okay. And if you need to speak for more than 15, I'm, I'm not on the clock. Okay. Uh, you can get it once. You will get it at the end of the wizard course. Once you watched everything, that's the very last thing is you can book straight into my calendar. You can book a 15 minute slot and we will talk. I know, first of all, you may just want to talk. Sometimes something that I've explained about the products isn't clear and you don't know which one to go for. You've not understood the differences. I'm here for that. Okay. We've got, also got a great team there, so we're here to help you. Don't hesitate, but if you want to speak with me, yeah, that's possible. Okay. Do you conduct the SIM session? If I purchase the SIM session course, thank you. Well, the best thing that you can do, yeah, I can do it in Cannes because I've got, I live not too far from that and I instruct there. That's where I instruct MCC at the moment, but the best thing for you to do is to do it with Michel. Michel, he's just, he's just the boss. He's just the best. Okay. So do it with Michel, or he's also got some other people that he's trained there that do that year in, year out. And uh, I mean, he blew me away when I went to see a session. So yeah, so people who are on the course get access to him. In the sim screening, with whom am I going to fly? Ah, is it a pilot from Wizz Air or another applicant? Most of the time you are with another applicant that has the same experience level. But I've, had, I've heard that sometimes you can be less fortunate. And they can put candidates that are not very good because they don't have the same level of training as you do. So you end up with someone who's just not very good in the sim and you have to manage that. And it's quite hard. 
it's really hard. I told you a wizard selection is that I find them tough. I find them tough. That's why you really need to put all your chances on your side so that you're not too dependent on outside circumstances. I hope I answered your question, Jay. What are the deviations accepted during the sim? Well, obviously they will not be the same as what's expected during an LPC, which is five degrees each side when you, when you end plus minus 150 feet. We understand people are stressed. So long they're correcting, then it's fine. If people just make deviations and make them worse, then it means that there's no situational awareness and that's a fail, I'm afraid. Are there problems to be solved involving charts or performance graphs on the big day? Problems, no. You need to tell them where you are just by looking at the needles. They will give you a map and with the VORs drawn, you need to show them where you are. That's, the, that's for, peop, for some people, I've had candidates when I was recruiting, for them it was a problem. Is there an option to book and buy, let's say, a one hour, one hour, one with a professional? Yes, you can book a one hour, one hour, one with me, but that's only accessible for people who've bought the course. There's no point for us to start to do one-to-one -one trainings with people who've not done the course, because then, I mean, the base knowledge is just not going to be there. Someone says, I had an experience with the ways where I was paired with someone who only spent one hour of prepping the sim. There you go. Well, it's tough. It's so tough. Uh, uh, the best thing you can do then is to just keep, keep cool. Keep, uh, help him out or her out. Don't blame them for anything. Don't show any sign of nervousness. It's okay. We're going to make it. I'm going to help you. This sort of attitude. Okay. Remain composed at all times. Hello. Is Michel available in? Yeah. Michel is available for a sim prep in Paris. Yes, he is. Could we come back to the right answer of the question? Why should we hire you? Aha. Okay. Why should we hire you? Remember the key competencies? There were eight. So what should a good pilot be? Well, you're just going to list the eight competencies a good pilot should have. Should it be motivated? He should have a good communication, good workload management, etc. Why should we hire you? Because you're going to say that you've got them. You're just going to need to prepare your answer in a slightly different way, reflects your personality and using your own words. Okay. That you see, it's a technique at the end of the day. That's why I'm telling you, you need to learn this to succeed. But then after that, once you've learned it, the thing to know as well is, our program works, so that's where it's unique because you've got pre people preparing specifically for British Airways, specifically for Air France, specifically for, but in fact, once you've learned what we teach, you can apply it for any airline. Your chances are going to increase so much at every airline, your whole career. And don't think that, say you're successful at, at with Air, which I, I hope for you from the bottom of my heart, I hope this for you, but your interviewing career is not over. You know, it's sometime you're going to want to move away from with Air or you're going to want to stay at Wizard for, for a very long time. Why? Because they're going to give you opportunities. Each of these opportunities means there's going to be another interview, an interview to become an instructor, an interview to become a captain, an interview to, you know, you need to have that skill. You need to have, but the thing is, once you've understood it, once you've got it forever, it's in your DNA and you, you never need to buy another advanced interview course in your life. Okay, good. How much do we have to adapt the CV and cover letters model depending on the country that they are from? It's not so much the country. You need to adapt the cover letter based on the airline. Each airline has a different strategy. So say that you, you apply, okay, I'm just citing my home country. You apply for Air France. You're going to tell, you, you, the beginning of the cover letter is always the same. It talks about you, who you are roughly, what, what, what you're roughly in a very few words, what job you're applying for and your flying career, how many hours? Okay, roughly, that's it. How many licenses you have? Just so you know, okay, this guy is like that. Then after that, you're going to talk about them and why you're excited to work for them. You'll be excited to work for Air France or British Airways because it's a legacy career. It makes you dream because the opportunities of long haul, blah, blah, blah. It's exciting. If you now apply for, uh, in, uh, in France, for a subsidiary of Air France called Hub, for instance, you're going to be excited for other reasons a faster upgrade, the opportunity to, you know, to, uh, to, to get involved quicker, the possibility of still being part of a large group, but on a more human sized enterprise. And if you're applying for any low cost airline anywhere, you're going to be excited because low cost airlines, and I say this often are better companies than major airlines. Actually, they make more money. It means they're a more sustainable employer. It means they will have the opportunity to invest in their planes and being green for longer. They, um, they are much better companies actually. And so this is exciting. You want to be in an exciting company that gives opportunities. You want to upgrade fairly soon. You don't want to wait until you've got gray hair like myself. Okay. 
So the, a, a letter will be tailored to who your employer is. And you could be excited by both British Airways and Ryanair for different reasons. You like them both for different reasons. Okay. Something we've not gone through is you can go on our Discord channel. Okay. You go on our Discord channel and there's a channel for each airline. Okay. That's recruiting at the moment. And I suggest that you go there. So you would go, typically you would go in the Wizz Air channel. You see something's been posted today. Okay. It's about the event, but you could ask that. And it's likely that someone will answer your question there. Okay. Good stuff. Why could the psychometrics be the last part of the interview, such as with for 10 people? Do you mean that uh, only five past well, five people failed the, there were 10 people going for the psychometrics and five failed? I don't know. You know, I don't know that they do it the way they want to do it. You just need to accept that. That's it. And just be the best you can be at every stage. For me, the bigger question is why do they decide to make the group interview an eliminatory stage? I mean, this is like, I don't understand it. I'm sure if one day I meet my wizard colleagues, they will explain this to me and there's probably a good reason for it. At the end of the day, it's a good airline. It's a safe airline, an airline that's giving lots of opportunities. Um, people are happy there. So I'm sure that their recruitment is, has its own logic and it works. We are here to help you make it work. Are you going to release the course for Air France for free? Yes, it is already. Mr. A, just go there. You see free course Air France. It's there and uh, people love it. Good. Are we done with questions guys? Well, I guess that will be it.